years ago I was with the pastor, Brother Bobby Moore, and we were in a hospital. We were making a visit, and uh, he, he leaned down to a patient that wasn't doing well at all, and he said, uh, I want to pray for you. And he said, years ago, he told this to the patient, he said, um, I used to think that prayer was all I could do until one day the Lord just got all over me and convicted me and said, prayer is not the only thing you can do, it's the very best thing you can do for anyone or any organization. And before we enter into a time of preaching, I want to just sort of pull us back to a place where we might pray for a sister church in our community. Many of you have seen uh, online, no doubt, uh, pictures of uh, Longview Heights Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Wayne Marshall is the uh, pastor there, and their church had a pipe burst. And I'm telling you, their, their sanctuary, beautiful sanctuary, is underwater, at least half of it. And, uh, and so they've had big trucks and all that stuff there this week trying to get all the water out, and it's a massive inconvenience. You say, well, do they have insurance? They've got all that. They're being responsible, but what an inconvenience. And uh, would you just, would you bow with me right now, and let's lift them up today. They're having additional services to be able to uh, host their, their family, and let's pray for them that they won't be discouraged. Let's pray that during this time of cleanup and restoration that really, perhaps, God will do something in them as a church that they never dreamed of. Father, I want to thank you for Pastor Wayne. I want to thank you for Longview Heights as a sister church in this community. They love you, and they have a bright testimony in our community for you. And we pray as they just go through a time of cleanup and restoring their building back to order that you'd help them to be patient and that you'd help them to have joy in you, to not be discouraged. And I pray that beyond all the work and the inconvenience, Lord, I pray that perhaps you'll use this time of inconvenience to speak to them and change them and make them more like yourself as a people. I pray today they'll have fantastic services where you are exalted and, and people's lives are changed. And thank you that they've got the space to do that, that they're able to meet today. That's a gift from you. But we do pray for them as a sister church in our community that you'd bless them and enrich them today as they go through this very inconvenient time. In Christ's name, we lift them up in faith. Amen. Open your Bibles to the uh, letter of Galatians. We'll get there in a minute, and you can go to Galatians chapter 5. Last week, we started a very brief uh, new preaching series, and we've entitled it Doing Life Together, Doing Life Together. Last week, we spoke about the priority of love, and we went to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, and, and we learned from the Apostle Peter that authentic love for one another expresses itself in sincerity. It's got to be sincere. It's brotherly. It's, it's earnest. It's passionate. And, and it's pure. It doesn't have mixed motives. And uh, as we thought about all those very descriptive adjectives that describe this kind of one another love, I came to the conclusion early on that we can't do that in our own strength. And we need the power of God in us, and we need Him to encourage us to love others with that kind of love. And I pray that as we move through this series and talk about some of these one another's, you'll be reminded that it's a very, very real call in our lives, and we need the power of God to do it. Now this week, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5. Uh, beginning with verse 13, going through verse 15. And, and by God's grace, we're going to see through the Apostle Paul that Jesus and, and what he accomplished for us has made us free to love and serve one another. In fact, Galatians 5.1, Paul writes, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. If the gospel's about anything, it's about freedom. It's about escape from bondage. Escape from being in the prisons that we make for ourselves so very often. But when you talk about freedom, and especially Christian freedom, you have to ask yourself, what exactly are we talking about? What's it mean to be free? Um, I think there's probably a lot of things we could say, but I'll say this starting out. Freedom is a lot more than doing whatever you want to do. You, you ought to write that down. Freedom is a lot more than just doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, where I want to do it. Freedom's more than that. In fact, freedom's an opportunity. It's the ability 
It's the desire to do those things that will bring you the deepest and the best joy 10,000 years from now. Many things that people do in the name of freedom actually lead to self-destruction. That's why Christians ought never envy the freedom of a lost person. We should never look on that individual outside their living free and wild and pursuing every desire, every lust, everything in this world and go, man, that looks like so much fun. May I say to you, that kind of fun lasts for a very brief season and it ends most of the time in a train wreck. You and I should never envy the freedom of that person outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of those folks are living lives in tremendous bondage. Now from this truth in Galatians 5, we're going to learn an important truth. Christian freedom is not freedom, excuse me, Christian freedom is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. You need to really embrace that. It's, it's freedom from sin, not the freedom to sin. Uh, the great reformer Martin Luther said, freedom is not the right to do what you want, but rather the power to do what you ought. That's freedom. The truly free person is the one who has the desire, the ability, the maturity to look at life face the future, judge the alternatives, and then choose to do those things that will make him the happiest in 10,000 years. See, Christian freedom is not doing whatever you dream of doing. Uh, your freedom in Christ is not the freedom to act on every wild impulse. Your freedom is to be able to do what God approves because you know it will bring you eternal happiness. And people who know Jesus, by the way, have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that will empower you to do what you ought to do. Titus says the grace of God is teaching us all the time to say no to everything that's ungodly. Now that doesn't mean that you won't slip and fall and make a mistake and sin and grieve or quench the Holy Spirit, but it does mean that if Jesus is really living in you, if you'll let Him control your life, lead your life, it will not lead you into bondage, it will lead you into this incredible freedom where you're empowered to do what pleases God. Here's the big challenge that faces all of us. We're free. Now what will we do with our freedom? We're free. What will we do with our freedom? In the book of Galatians, we meet up with the Judaizers. It's a group of so-called Christian leaders who, well, they come from a Jewish background and they claim to represent the apostles in Jerusalem. And these men were influencing the young Galatian believers, most of them Gentiles, by the way, and they were pressing them to be circumcised. And in doing so, they were trying to put them underneath the law of Moses as a means of pleasing God. There's not a lot of positive things that you can say about the Judaizers. But this morning, I think I should at least say a word on their behalf. And we'll understand them better if you and I consider the moral condition of the Roman Empire in the first century. Time does not allow for all the things that could be said or maybe even needs to be said. But uh, before you get all crazy and think, you know, Western civilization is the worst in the history of the world. I mean, living in the 21st century is probably as bad as it's ever been. Watch this. We may not even come close to the wickedness that prevailed in the first century in the Roman and Greek empires. It's really hard for us to truly understand how morally degraded the world was during that time. Regarding sexual ethics, people say it was nothing but pure chaos. Uh, one writer described it as an age when shame seems to have vanished completely. Uh, the famous orator Demosthenes declared, we keep mistresses for our pleasure, concubines for our day-to-day -day needs of the bodies, but we have wives 
in order to produce children legitimately and to have a trustworthy guardian of our homes. How many of you ladies would like to live in that kind of culture? Almost every famous Greek figure had a mistress. That includes Alexander the Great, Aristotle, and even Plato. Seneca commented, listen to this, this is so bad. Seneca said, virginity is simply proof that you're ugly. Did you hear what I said? There's no class in that. There's no love in that. He said, innocence is not rare. Seneca said, it's non-existent. Modesty was completely unknown. Homosexuality was found in every layer of society from the highest to the lowest. Historians tell us that 14 of the first 15 Roman emperors were homosexuals, including Julius Caesar. And so it's against that backdrop of pure moral chaos that that you and I ought to at least try to judge the Judaizers. And knowing the immorality of Rome and Greece, they, they thought the only way to fight that was with rules, rules, and more rules. Their diagnosis was on target. Their prescription was dead wrong. Rules don't set people free. Amen? Let's look at verse 13. Twice in Galatians 5, Paul declares that believers are now free. In in Galatians 5.1, he says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then in verse 13, the first part of that verse, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Now, freedom is an absolutely wonderful word, but it's a dangerous concept. Real freedom leaves you with all sorts of choices to make. It requires self-discipline, and if it's not there, it'll soon disintegrate into anarchy, lawlessness. Well, well, how are we free as believers? Several ways. Uh, We're free from the guilt of sin. Thank God. We're free from the penalty of sin. We're free from the shame of sin. I met with a young man probably a month ago in my office, and he said, Brother Tim, I'm, I'm no longer in bondage to the shame that I was living in because of all the sin in my life. God's made me free. Free from the shame of sin. Free from the power, the authority of sin. Free from the power of the law to condemn us. Listen, that means that because we're free, you and I can come to God anytime, anywhere, on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ and have complete confidence that He'll receive us, that you and I will be accepted. That's the kind of freedom and the authority that belongs to every blood-washed believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our freedom in Jesus is first and foremost, it is spiritual freedom that opens up a brand new and everlasting relationship with Almighty God through His precious, wonderful Son. Free! When you met Jesus, think back to where you were, who you were, and and what you were in bondage to. I know some of your stories. Some of you would say with me, I don't want to go back there. Amen. But freedom, the freedom that I've just described, does not mean that we don't struggle with sin any longer. Uh, We're not free from the presence of sin. In fact, we won't be free from the presence of sin until we stand face to face before our Lord in heaven. Heaven, nor are we free from what we would call the pull of the flesh that leads us into sin. Uh, we're free from the bondage of trying to please God through rules. We're, we're free from trying to please God through some sort of ritual or ceremony. We're free from the overwhelming guilt of sin. But sin itself remains with us, even in us. So, so are we free, really? Yes. Yes, we are, but that freedom can be abused. Freedom can be misused. And so the very next part of verse 13 explains what this means, both negatively and positively. Look at what he says in the second half of verse 13 of chapter 5. But but don't use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Sometimes the sinful nature is referred to in the Bible as the flesh. Paul says, rather serve 
one another in love. Don't use your freedom for the wrong things. He says instead, use the freedom that you have to serve one another in love, the love that's been shed abroad in your hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now, the word indulge in this verse is an interesting word. It, it really, it's a military term, and it refers to a base of operations that an army establishes in enemy territory. And from this base of operations, the army can then launch attacks in, in many directions. Now, here's the deal. You can misuse your freedom by indulging your flesh, your sinful nature, by having a base of operations in your life from which you sort of commit all sorts of sinful behavior. Flesh. What's that mean? Well, again, it's, it's not referring to our physical flesh and bones. It's a direct reference to the fallen nature that all of us inherited for, from Adam. It's the nature you were born with. We were born with a fallen nature, and that nature stays with us in one form or another until the day we die. And even though we're redeemed, and even though Christ has made us new, the flesh is always with us, always pulling us down and dragging us toward the world, enticing us to every sort of moral and spiritual compromise. Why do we do some of the things we do? I mean, like Paul, we say, I, I want to do things that please God, but I, I wind up doing the very things that break his heart. I despise those things, and yet I wind up doing them. What's going on in me? It's the flesh. It pulls us toward anger, toward lust, toward bitterness, toward violence, toward cheating, adultery, perversion, envy, greed. And we could just say every sin that you and I will ever commit it's because the old human nature, the flesh, is pulling you back, trying to pull you back into submission under that awful kind of life. One writer defines the flesh as the inner desire for selfish gratification at the expense of God and others. That is an awesome definition. Did you hear what I just said? It's that inner desire. It's the old nature trying to get you to satisfy these cravings in your life. But here's the sad part. At the expense of God and others. See, you never sin in private. I, I hear it all the time. Uh, listen, what I do is my life, and I'm not hurting anyone. That's never true. It's never true. Most of the time, there is always some ripple effect, and it does impact family uh, members, uh, friends, church members, your, your community. But, but let's just say in the rare event that you could sin and your sin really didn't touch another human being, it always compromises, it always touches the heart of God. Every time we disobey God, it's at the expense of His glory. Every time we do something, every time we allow ourselves to be yanked back into the submission of the old nature, we do it at the expense of God and others. There's something inside of us. That old nature says, go ahead, man. You deserve it. You've earned it. Nobody can stop you. Even though we know, we know that the very thing we're thinking of doing is sinful. No, the flesh loves to be pampered, and it whines like a big, fat baby when it doesn't get its way. You say, how do you know that? Because I've done it. I've got an old nature. At the very core of Tim Lampley, I've got an old fleshly nature that doesn't want me to submit to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you that when we give in to that old nature, it leads to sin. It leads to compromise and eventually to outright sinful behavior that grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit of God. Here's the tricky part. The flesh, the old nature, can attack you anytime, anywhere. That's why sometimes in your quiet time, when you're trying to read your Bible, uh, some of the most wicked thoughts can enter your mind and try to derail you from having quality time with God. Am I alone in that? 
That's why when you pray, you listen, your mind can be attacked, and instead of praying for someone, you can start rehearsing an, an old grudge or an old wound, and before you know it, you, you're not praying any longer. You're just sort of under your breath mumbling all sorts of hatred and bitterness towards another individual. The flesh, the old nature can attack you anytime, anywhere. You can be witnessing for Jesus to a lost person, and then with your next breath, you can blast one of your kids or wipe your spouse out with a short word. The same hand that reaches out in love can knock a person flat. I, I want to say this. Don't ever underestimate the power and the pull of the flesh. Don't ever say, I I I'll never sin anymore. I'll never be tempted in that area again. I'm above that. I'm a mature believer. I've grown to the point that no longer is a threat to my life. Take heed lest ye fall. Don't ever, don't ever underestimate the power, the pull of the flesh. No, biblical freedom is never freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. It's the power to overcome. It's the power to get up, fight the battle again and again and again. It's the power to persevere. It's the power that allows you, even if you mess up today, to, to get up tomorrow morning and by the glory of God say, I I'm going to live fresh today for Christ. Look at verse 14. Paul says the entire law is summed up in a single command. That is an awesome statement. The entire law, and there's a bunch of it, is summed up in one single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying there's, there's a better way than indulging the flesh. And, and Paul calls it serving one another in love. But it's a little bit ironic. The word serving comes from a Greek word that means to be a slave. So, so we're set free from our slavery to sin by the power of Christ. And having now become free, we're called to become slaves in another way for the sake of the gospel. He's saying instead of being masters with many servants, he says, I want you to be servants with many masters. I want you to serve one another. Serve everybody in the spirit of love. And the emphasis on love here is important. In fact, it's, it's a core truth. Because it's never law on the outside, but it's always love on the inside that makes the difference. And here's where the Judaizers made their huge, tragic mistake. They thought the only way to change human behavior was through a system of rules. They thought if, if we don't want to get sucked into the the chaos and the immorality of the Romans and the Greeks. We've just got to live by this set of rules. But laws never change the heart. Christianity works because it changes people from the inside out. Salvation's always an inside job. Christian freedom's always an inside job. Romans 5.5 5 says, The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It happens from within. And we need to remember that. And that's why we need to cut each other a lot of slack and extend grace and not focus on laws and rules and extra-biblical expectations. We need to just know that we need to operate in the realm of love, the love of God that's been poured out in our hearts. Love frees people, not only from sin, but to serve God and serve one another. It was love that motivated our Heavenly Father, I believe, to send Jesus to the earth. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. Love says, I'm going to go out beyond myself. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your needs. Love just reaches out beyond. What, what, what is narcissism? Someone said narcissism is the ability to commit to anything as long as it's just for you. So that means the opposite of that would be it's the inability to commit to anything beyond yourself. That, that's what a narcissist is. It's a person who lives in the world of, of me, me, me. 
I'm telling you, God wants us to live in a completely different realm. He wants us to live in the realm of love. Love sees the need, and then love begins to move out and meet the need, even at great personal cost. When our Lord was in the garden on the evening of his arrest, it's a famous moment. It's a turning point. It's uh, really one of those uh, hinge moments in the gospel story. And, and he is filled with anxiety about what's about to transpire in his life. And, and he pleads with God in the garden, if there's any other way to accomplish this mission of redeeming mankind, oh God, let it be that way. And then he said, basically, but, but if there's no other way to get it done, then your will be done, not mine. Do you understand that it was that love that God exemplified through Jesus on earth at great personal cost? Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. At great personal cost, God gave us his son at great personal cost. Jesus was nailed to the cross, not because of any sin he'd committed, no, no crime he'd ever committed, but he was taking our place. He was doing something we could never do for ourselves at great personal cost. He became the one who drank the cup of God's wrath. He was accursed of God. He became a curse on that tree. God momentarily turned his back on his son for the first time in their eternal relationship. Listen to me. Salvation's free for us, but it was never cheap. Love always acts, always moves, and it's willing to do so even at great personal cost. Before he left his disciples... He declared that love was to be the distinguishing mark for his followers. John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. We would have probably done something different. Had I had the opportunity, maybe I would write something like this. Now, I'm going to be leaving in a while, but I want the world to know that you're mine. So here's the deal. The world will know that you're my disciples if you go to the right church. Uh, the world will know that you're my disciple if you say the right prayers, uh, sign the right doctrinal statement, go to the right school, um, uh, wear your hair the right way, uh, dress and act like every other Christian. Bunch of nonsense. But Jesus said the only way to spot one of his disciples is by the way they love each other. Think about that. See, the gospel changes the heart, and a changed heart always, always leads to changed relationships. That's why if you're here today, and your marriage is hanging by a thread, and you're about to give up hope, don't. I'm telling you that when you let God come into your life, even if you're already a believer, if you surrender your will your heart, your rights to God. If you're willing to do that, a changed heart always 100% of the time will lead to a change in your relationships. There is no marriage that God can't fix. Now, there's some people that refuse to be fixed, and sometimes divorce still happens. But I'm telling you that if Two people are willing to say, I surrender all. The sky's the limit. You say, man, I'm jammed up with my parents. I'm, I'm jammed up with a co-worker. I'm, I'm ready just to, you know, I want to whack that guy. I want to disassociate completely. Ask God to change your heart. Because changed hearts always lead to changes in our relationships. This series of the one another's that we're going through, doing life together, 
is based on all the, the one another statements that we find in the New Testament. And some of you didn't believe me when I said this was going to be a brief series. I think I introduced the, the series through the, the, you know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as a brief series. And over a year later, we, we finally finished. But, but I've limited myself, and I believe under the leadership of God, to six one another statements. Six. That's six sermons. But there are dozens of these one another statements. Let me, let me read a few of them. Because they all flow out of this love that's been shed abroad in our hearts that leads to a real change in the way we relate to others. Bear one another's burdens. Build one another up. Admonish one another. Forgive one another. Comfort one another. Pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another. Teach one another. Greet one another. Spur one another on. Watch this one. Accept one another. That's big, by the way. Encourage one another. Give preference to one another. That is, Philippians 2 says it this way, esteem others as being more important than yourself. Be devoted to one another. Be kind to one another. Here's a hard one. Submit to one another. Husbands, it's right to submit yourself to your wife. And wives, it's right to submit yourself to your husband. We're called to submit to one another. And of course, Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. And there's so many others that we could add to the list. All these one another's, are simply reflections and amplifications of the great command given by Jesus Himself to love one another. Here's the deal. When Christ saves you, the Holy Spirit invades you, and He empowers you to love and serve others. He breaks you out of the prison of self. He sets you free. And here's where I struggle. It's hard to explain, maybe even to describe what it means to serve one another in love. And maybe, maybe this is one of those truths when you just sort of know it when you see it. Maybe love is better experienced than it is defined. So in 2004, God called me to Broadway Baptist Church. And I left a ministry in Tupelo where we'd been for 14 years. I'd been their senior pastor. and God called me and my family here to serve Broadway Baptist Church and to be Dr. Bobby Moore's associate pastor. And th there were a lot of things that went into that. But God brought us here. And, and then, really, really, after, I thought the timing was just way too brief, but after about two and a half years, Brother Bobby had to resign because Miss Joyce had so progressed in her Alzheimer's disease. And, and he didn't resign. He didn't retire because he was sick or because he didn't want to preach anymore. He literally retired as the full-time lead pastor of this church so he could devote himself completely to his wife, Joyce. The church asked me to be their pastor, and... Brother Bobby stayed on as pastor emeritus, and, and I had the privilege to occasionally go by and sit with him and visit with him, and we still did some ministry together, but I, I went by their home on a fairly regular basis, and one day I, I was there, and uh, he had Miss Joyce at the kitchen table. And Now, if you didn't know, Brother Bobby could make some weird stuff, and he, he used weird ingredients. He he loved apple cider vinegar, and he nearly made me sick one day trying to heal me. Um, he thought it was a cure-all from everything from baldness to anxiety, and I'll tell you what, I took a big gulp of that junk, and I determined in my heart while I would submit to his leadership, I would never drink that concoction again. But he was famous for sort of mixing up these weird concoctions, and I went in there, and he and Miss Joyce were at the table, and he had this really a big, big tumbler filled with all manner of stuff. It, it, it was somewhere between liquid and solid. You couldn't drink it out of a straw. You couldn't 
drink it. So he was spoon feeding Miss Joyce, and he said she loves this stuff. I didn't say anything to him, but I'll be honest. I thought I'm glad she does, because it don't look like anything I want to put in here. But he'd give her a big spoon of that stuff. After every spoon, he said, "I love you." Dead silence. I was there. This is not a story that he told me. I was there. Another big spoon, I love you, Joyce. Nothing. This went on forever. He just gave her another big spoon. and I mean, it had it, been a long time. He gave her a spoon and said, I love you. And all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, her eyes lit up and she looked right at him and she said, in the sweetest voice, I love you too. And it was like a spiritual bomb had detonated in that room. And he stopped everything. He looked at me and he said, that's the first time she has spoken to me in over two and a half weeks. He said, it's just been silence. And then he said this to me, I live for moments like this. He bathed her. He dressed her. He fixed her hair the best he could, did his best at applying some makeup. He always wanted her to look nice. He put her to bed. He got her out of bed. He fixed all the meals. He cleaned the entire home. He took care of the yard work. He literally did everything, and sometimes for long stretches without ever one word of, I love you or thank you. Sometimes love can't be defined or explained. You just have to see. Here's the deal. God has set us free to love and serve one another. If you're a guest, you may be wondering, what is going on with that pastor? Well, my, my spiritual gift is crying. <laughs> and uh, the older I get, the, I become a big baby. And sometime early this morning, that fountain got turned on. Let me tell you one last thing, and we'll try to wrap this up. Verse 15. If you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out. Watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. Verse 15. So Paul ends with what I would call a very stern word of warning, because freedom always goes in two directions. We either use our freedom as an excuse to sin, or we use our freedom as a means to love and serve others. And if we make the tragic decision to choose self-indulgence, we risk destroying our friendships and tearing apart the family of God. Let me give you two equations that make it real simple. Freedom plus love equals service to others. Freedom plus love equals service to others. Freedom minus love equals freedom to sin. And when you look at it like that, you begin to understand how love fulfills the whole law. It is the lack of love that causes men, people, to hate their parents. It is the lack of love that causes people to commit murder. It is the lack of love that causes people to be unfaithful to their spouse steal, lie. It's the lack of love that causes bitterness, anger, threats, verbal, physical abuse, and, and the list could go on and on. It's the lack of love that leads to pushing others around, demanding your own way, arguing over stupid minor issues, and dividing the body of Christ. But if we really, really loved our neighbor, 
all those sins I just mentioned would be absolutely impossible. Where God's love reigns, sin cannot abide, but where self reigns, sin rules. And where sin rules, chaos ensues. Believers have never been very good at fighting fair. We let small disagreements become major issues. Some people elevate secondary matters of faith to the level of a core truth like the deity of Jesus Christ. And then we begin to bicker and fight and argue. And when we do that, we inevitably harm the cause of Christ. Our bitter arguments eventually become more important than Jesus. And it puts an end to Christian peace destroys the work of the gospel, causes the church that's engaged in that kind of nonsense to turn inward. It'll turn new believers away from the church. It always dishonors the Lord. It always grieves the Spirit. Sometimes it'll cause a weak Christian to give up on their faith in despair. It'll force people to take sides on things that aren't even commanded. It always injures the testimony of the church. That kind of junk confirms the criticism of skeptics who, who say and believe the church is full of hypocrites. And that kind of behavior always causes the enemies of the gospel to rejoice. That kind of junk sends the message to the world, God may love you, but we hate each other. And in the end, in the end, that kind of life, that kind of behavior always destroys God's church. Hatred, envy, power plays, vicious words, insisting on your own way always damages the church. There can never be victory while we're wrapped up in consuming, devouring one another. Verse 15 actually describes what we could call Christian cannibals who destroy each other. They're like wild animals who aren't content until they literally destroy one another. I've been praying all week, God, please let Broadway be the exact opposite of that which I've just described. Let me give you four things, just four statements that you can sort of, the core truths of this passage Number one, Christian freedom, Christian freedom is never the right to do what we want. It's always the power to do what we ought to do. Secondly, freedom that is not guided by love will soon turn into destructive self-destruction. Three, when we act with love towards others, we have fulfilled the law of God. And fourth, God's love and bitter strife can never, and I mean this, can never coexist. It is spiritual oil and water. And with that, we kind of go back to where we started. Christian freedom is the opportunity, the ability, and the desire to do those things that will give you the greatest happiness, the greatest joy 10,000 years from now. See, all of us want that kind of freedom. In fact, you were born for it, made for it. God created you to enjoy that it's the freedom that goes beyond the cheap substitute that the world tries to jam down your throat. Brothers, sisters, we're called to this freedom. And Paul says it again with emphasis, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And I've been praying all week long, oh God, set us free, empower us to live like the free children of God. And Lord, may we live in that freedom with, with the priority of loving and serving others. Stand up with me and bow your head. Ryan's going to come up with the musicians, and I'm going to ask the staff that's here today to join me. Let's pray together. Father, I believe we've, we've heard your word today. We've been confronted with truth. 
And we thank you, first of all, for the freedom that is ours through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we thank you that when you, when you save us, you set us free. But we want to express gratitude to you this morning that our freedom is not freedom to sin, it's always freedom from sin. Help us not to abuse the grace of God. Help us not to ignore the gift of Christ. Help us, Lord, to just simply begin to live in the power that's been given to us through your indwelling Holy Spirit and to just flesh out in very practical, real ways the love that's been poured out in our hearts through Jesus. Help us to stop being so self-centered, so self-oriented, and help us, Lord, to fix our eyes not only on Jesus but on others. You've set us so that we might be free to love and in that love serve others. Lord, help us this week to serve our families. Help us this week to serve our co-workers. Help us this week to serve our neighbors, our community. Help us this week to serve someone that doesn't like us. Help us to serve someone this week who treats us mean. Help us this week to determine that we'll take our cues from you and you alone. Help us to live out that wonderful statement that the world will know that we are your disciples by the love we have for one another. And let that love be manifested in self-sacrificing service. We need you. This is a tall order. We can't do it in our puny strength. We need for you to be seated on the throne of our lives to be able to accomplish this kind of worthy goal. Come in in a fresh way today. Help us, Lord, to confront all the things that assault our lives and help us to deal with any compromises that we may be involved in right now. If anybody in this room is abusing the freedom that belongs to them through Jesus, Lord, I pray today you'd stop them in their tracks, that in love you would convict them and break them and bring them to a place of authentic repentance where they have a change of mind and a change of direction. Jesus, we need you. In your name we pray. Amen. Look this way. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never really believed on him for salvation, today is your day. You can't begin to accomplish some of the things we talked about in your own strength. You need Christ in you to accomplish this kind of lifestyle. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you've never believed on Christ alone for your forgiveness and salvation, today it would be our joy to introduce you to Jesus. If you're here without a church home, we'd love to welcome you to our family, Broadway Baptist Church. And if you know Jesus, you meet the big prerequisite. We'd love to embrace you, not into a perfect fellowship, but into a church family that strives and longs to be all that God has called us to be for his glory and, and for the growth and encouragement of one another. Maybe you just need prayer. Maybe there's something going on. There's really a, a battle going on in your life spiritually, and you'd like for one of us to pray with you and pray for you. It'd be our joy. So as we sing this closing song, if God has spoken to you today and you'd like to confirm it and nail it down, we'd like to minister to you. You come as Ryan leads us. Thank you.